This is going to be my thumbnail. I'm going to have to uh, Photoshop in some cash because I don't have any. Right, questions and answers. Thank you to everybody who um, sent in questions. I think I've had like 200, 250 questions, so it's far, far too many to answer in one uh, video. It would be like five hours long, but uh, I'm going to answer the ones that I think appeal to the most people. And also a lot of those questions, they were all very similar. So by answering one person's question, might well answer your question. Um, I'd also like to uh, give a disclaimer, a pronunciation disclaimer, okay? I'm going to struggle with some of your names. Um, don't worry, don't take offence, because I struggle with a lot of pronouncing of, you know, locations, hills, mountains. I'm constantly getting grief on YouTube because I mispronounce things. Laurig fell. And it's not going to stop here today, so uh, may as well just say that. So I'm going to start off with the really juicy stuff. Um, and it's to do with sponsorship and it's to do with money. So Ashley Hemsley wants to know if I have any sponsors, if so, who? Um, Bulat Scan... Bulat wants to know, when did you begin photography and is it your full-time job? And Richard Marshall says, can you talk about income and can you make a living from landscape photography? Those three, those five questions, um, they, they fit together very well, so I'm going to answer them all in one go. When did you begin photography? I began photography as a very young child, um, although I didn't really seriously start photography until I was 16 and shot film and developed my own uh, images in the darkroom. It was fantastic. Right, sponsors. Do I have any sponsors? Um, yes, I do. Uh, some official and some unofficial, and we'll get into that uh, very briefly. Um, but first, I would like to say thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you need a website or online store, go to squarespace.com forward slash Heaton and start your free trial. If you like that free trial, use the promo code Heaton and get 10% off your first purchase. Yes, I have sponsors. Squarespace sponsors videos and it's fantastic. Some people don't like it. Some people get angry when they see a video is sponsored and this annoys me more than anything else. Now, I get it if the sponsor doesn't fit with the content, okay? That's fine, I understand that. But for any creative to have a large corporate sponsor on board is only a good thing. Because being a creative is very difficult to get paid. And we all know that in this world, um, you need money to live and to do stuff and to continue to grow. So by creatives, being sponsored, it allows them to create more and to create better. Um, and then it, that fundamentally trickles back down to you guys because you get more free content and so on and so forth. So if, you, if you're watching a video and there's, they're getting sponsored or you know product placement or something and you feel that twinge of anger and you're about to leave a nasty comment or an angry comment, just don't do it. Just think for a second um, and look at the bigger picture. Uh, you'll also notice there's no adverts on this channel. I'll turn them off because it's sponsored by Squarespace. I don't, I don't need two, in two sources of income from one video. That's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, sponsored by Squarespace, and I am very proud of that, and I appreciate it massively. And it's because of, um, it's because of you guys actually that Squarespace sponsored me. So without an audience, you don't get sponsorships, and that's quite sad because there's a lot of talent out there who may not have a big audience, therefore they don't get sponsorships, and that is a shame. But because of the money from the sponsorships, I'm able to reinvest it in new bits and pieces um, that I can go on and make my videos better. So you enjoy more content, I can travel more, that kind of thing. So it's only a good thing. Unofficial sponsors. See, I do a lot of stuff with Canon, um, but I've never signed anything. I'm not sponsored by them at all. Um, but they always help me out if I need help. They'll lend me gear and I send it back to them. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to say I'm sponsored by them, but they definitely helped me out. Sorry, I'm getting numb legs. Um, Manfrotto. Again, I've never signed anything. I'm not sponsored by them, but they, we have a, a, a relationship and they help me out if I need anything. And yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, it makes my life so much easier. Lee Filters. Lee sent me loads of filters after I made a filter video a few months back. Again, never signed anything. I don't have to do anything. They send me them. Um, 
And that's it, probably in the hope that I'll use them and talk about them, and which I will because they're great filters. There we go. Oh no, it's stuck. There you go, filters, Lee filters by Lee, really good. But they don't, you know, like v VW lent me a van for a week and some guy left me a comment not too long ago actually saying, you know, if, you, if you're sponsored by v VW, at least have the decency to let your viewers know this sales pitch, blah, blah, blah. It has a table. Rubbish, absolute rubbish. VW lent me a van. I didn't sign anything. They didn't want anything in return. Yeah, I used it and I, I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to go in a camp van for a week and it was amazing. And it's because VW lent me a van and I guess in return, they, a lot of people saw the van in use, but it wasn't an official sponsorship, but I don't know, I guess sponsorship's a funny thing, um, but it's definitely a good thing, so long as it fits. Right, that's my rant on sponsorship over. Is photography your full-time job? Yes, but not landscapes. I wish it was just landscapes, but no, it's all kinds of stuff. Corporate, wedding, well, no, I don't do weddings anymore. I used to do weddings, corporate, I've got a studio, we do commercial, we do products, that kind of thing. But I have a big passion for landscapes. Can you talk about income and is it possible to make a living from landscape photography? Right, uh, I could talk about income just for landscapes, um, I make money from ad revenue, I make money from sponsorships with Squarespace, I make money from selling my calendar, I make money from selling my ebook, um, and I make money from affiliate links, uh, which are in the bottom of my videos. So by having, by going out and taking images and filming and making videos, I have an audience. By having an audience, I can sell to that audience. And I don't mean like a horrible kind of salesy kind of way, but just it's great to be able to offer things like calendars and books and whatnot. Um, and I'm very fortunate to have you guys who actually very kind of support me and buy my stuff. Uh, affiliate links. Again, people get really offended by affili affiliate links. Don't be. Please do not be offended by affiliate links. I used to list all of my kit in the description of the video. And it was just a list. Um, and then someone pointed out to me, why don't you, you know, do affiliate links and then... You can list, you can link to the products and if people buy them you get a commission. So I looked into it, it's all Amazon based. So I now have that list of my kit, but they're all links, right? And if you click on a link, it'll take you to Amazon. Um, and if you buy that product, you'll get, you know, Amazon, you're always going to get the best price on Amazon. So you're not going to get ripped off. Um, and I get a commission of about three, five, seven, eight percent. It varies massively from product to product. Um, and that's it, literally, everybody wins. You win because you're buying from Amazon and you get Amazon Prime next day delivery and it's probably the best price. I win because I get like 5% commission and Amazon wins because they get the business. So um, please don't be offended by affiliate links. Uh, I kind of get it if you know I was trying to sell something through an affiliate link that was a pile of rubbish and that I didn't use and believe in but my personal philosophy is if I use it and I'm happy with it and I believe in the product, I'm happy to tell other people about that. Anyways, enough enough about that. Um, that's pretty much it for income. You get, I get other little bits and pieces, magazine publications, um, occasionally someone will license an image and I get a little bit of money from talks. One thing I haven't ventured into is workshops. Um, I'm doing my sort of first proper work. Hang on, the dog's got something he shouldn't have. So yeah, you can make a living from landscape talk. I'm doing a talk, right? I do talks up and down the country, different events, camera clubs, that kind of thing. And the talk I'm doing at the minute is called The New Landscape Photographer. And it's all about how the new age social media has opened up this world, this world that was never accessible. Photography principally has not changed in like a hundred years. You've got an aperture and you've got a sensor, okay? That will always be the case. What has changed is the world around it and how we sell those images, how we share those images, how we market the images, how we market ourselves. And it's this world of social media and YouTube, you no longer do you need a publisher, no longer do you need an agent, no longer do you need, I don't know, a TV network to get your brand out there. You can have your own flipping TV network, start a YouTube channel, you can get an audience bigger than half the TV networks out there. So you can do everything yourself. As long as you're passionate and you're producing quality work, you will get the audience and you can make a living from landscape photography quite easily. I was talking about workshops. I got my workshops in July. Both of those were sold out. Uh, well, the first one sold out, so we added a second one. We added the second one. 
and that sold out. And then I've got a workshop in Acadia National Park in October. Uh, I think there's still places on that because that's part of a bigger event. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the whole workshop thing is completely, it's like a new line of revenue for me. It's something I've never really explored. Um, so that's another thing. But again, any money, it all comes down to being passionate. First of all, you have to be passionate and create the quality work. And then everything spans off from that. Never do I go out and think, how can I make money today? Ever. Never, never, never. It's always, how can I go out and make a great video today or take a great image today? Finances is the afterthought. And that's a good philosophy because I'm not... I'm not too fussed about money, um, I'm more interested, I'm more of a lifestyle guy. I'd rather be time rich than cash rich. Anyway, right, moving on. Hey Tom, hey Connor. This is Connor Lech... Oh my god, my viewers just have the hardest names to pronounce. Connor Lechoyer. 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 Connor Lechoyer. Hey Tom, what's your business model like? And how are, you, how are you generating enough income, the new gear, and the ability to travel? Uh, Connor, Connor, Connor. I don't have a business model. You know, I upload a video once a week, and I get about five, four, five hundred quid in ad revenue. So if I had a business model, right, I'd upload two videos a week, and I'd get nine hundred pounds a week. And then that business model, you know what that business model would say? He'd say, hey, Tom. Why don't you do four videos a week and get that 900 up to 1800? And then you know what the business model would say? <laughs> It'd say, hey Tom, why don't you do daily and get that, get that 1800 up to 2500 a week? Um, and, but you know what happened? The content would suffer. So, yeah. It's all about the photography. Blue J7. Have you ever been a victim of bullying? Do you have any learning deficiencies um, or traits you don't have to answer? Well, I do have to answer because it's an ask me anything and I'd like to answer. Have I ever been a victim of bullying? Not prolonged bullying, but I've encountered bullies. The bullies only do what they do, and this is a 100% irrefutable fact. 100%! If you're a bully, you're only picking on someone to make yourself feel better. Yeah, bullies awful. Do I have any learning deficiencies? No, I don't. Um, I'm a slow reader. It takes me ages to read a book, but no, I'm very, very lucky to be happy and healthy and yeah, very, very fortunate. Martin Murphy, what other cameras were you considering besides the 5D Mark IV? I thought you were considering the A7R2 and the 5D SR. Uh, yeah, I considered loads of cameras. Uh, I did consider the A7R2, but I think the, I wasn't happy with the battery life or the lenses. Um, and yeah, there's a few nice cameras, but I stuck with Canon because all my gear is already Canon, and I really was impressed with 5D Mark IV's uh, image quality. You know, a camera is a camera is a camera. If you look at a camera by Nikon, Canon, Pentax, Sony, and providing they're all the same range of camera, i.e. a consumer camera or a semi-professional or a professional, they're all pretty much of a muchness. They're all pretty much the same, okay? If I line up five images taken by five different cameras and print them all at 20 by 16, you can't tell me which picture was taken with which camera. Which camera? You just can't. Photo Joris. Photo Joris? Photo Joris? How many videos did it take you to get a lot of subscribers um, and how do you get work as a landscape photographer? So uh, the first one, how many videos to get a lot of subscribers? It's funny this because when I started YouTube, uh, I didn't know what YouTube was really, didn't know the potential of it. So I never looked at numbers, I just made videos and looked at the view count of the videos. Um, so with every video I made, it was made purely for the reason to, just to document a photo shoot. It wasn't until about six or seven videos in that I sort of became aware of subscribers and what they were and they were going up and then I'd start to compare myself against other channels uh, which actually is a really bad thing because if you look at some of the big tuber tubers, tubers, big YouTubers, Frono's Photos is on like 500,000 I'm one of those subscribers, I like him, I like his channel 
But um, you know, if you're at 50 subscribers and you look at Frono and see he's on 500 plus, you're gonna think, what? Um, so yeah, try not to worry about subscriber counts. Um, but yeah, it probably took me about six or seven videos before I realized, hang on, these numbers are growing. And then I was a bit like, oh man, how can these, these numbers should be higher? Look at these guys and yeah. But I'd like to think that I still make videos today for the same reasons I made videos two years ago. Um, and that is to inspire, to entertain, and I suppose to document, um, and also to get more views on my website. Okay, this is from Mads Oland Peterson. Um, what is the most inspiring place you've photographed? Uh, definitely Iceland, 100% Iceland. Iceland was my first ever dedicated photography trip. Um, icebergs, glaciers, mountains, geysers, it was phenomenal Iceland. So this is a question from the Topophile and he wants to know, will Brexit affect my work from a business standpoint? Um, uh, no, Brexit will not affect my work, I don't think. I, I'm a Remainer, I want to remain in the EU because I love the free travel and I'm a big fan of Europe and, um, and I always think it's better to be a part of something big. Lee Whitaker. When you are waiting at a location for a good few hours, like your last video, what do you do to pass the time? Uh, right, I'm really bad at this. Uh, most of the time I don't do anything, I wait. I just wait. Uh, I'll maybe do some video, maybe fly the drone. Um, I'll just sit impatiently and wait. Uh, sometimes I take a book with me, but not when I'm filming. When I'm filming, I concentrate. You know, having the time and waiting for the light to happen gives me a great opportunity to um, film some nice cutaway shots, some nice B-roll. Uh, so now I can sit there for hours, I'm quite happy with my own company and my own thoughts. Jason A. Did you study photography at school or university, or have you taught yourself? Bit of both. Well, I did media production at college, and as part of that I did photography. Media production at university, part of that did photography, but we never really practice landscape photography. All of that is 100% self-taught. But I always say this, landscape photography is easy. It's really, really easy. It's the difficulty is getting up and getting out. Um, hello. 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 How do you get the best... Okay, this is from Nisith Verma. How do you get the best landscape photo from a semi-pro crop sensor? Uh, I'll tell you how you get the best landscape photograph from a crop sensor. And that is to get up early and get outside, all right? I'll take two images, one with a crop sensor, one with a full frame, and I'll print them both, and I'll challenge anyone to tell me which was the full frame. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah, you get a wider view, but, and you get, I suppose you get better dynamic range, but you know, if you go out and you pick the right landscape and you get good conditions, dynamic range, you don't even need it. You get a well-balanced landscape shot 20 minutes before sunrise you ain't gonna struggle with dynamic range, especially if it's on a winter's day. Um, so yeah, it's all about the location and shooting uh, the most appropriate scene. Um, hey, I'd start using Lee filters, expensive, for landscape photography, which filters are must-haves? Okay, so this is a question from Thomas, or at Dexter on Twitter. Um, so he wants to know about Lee filters, must-have Lee filters, get a polarizer, get a three-stop ND filter, and then probably one grad, depending on what you want to shoot. If you live on the coast and you shoot seascapes, get hard grad, probably three stops. If you're inland and you shoot mountains and woodland and, you know, uh, scenes that have wonky, uneven horizons, get a two stop soft edge. Winter, winter. As a new photographer, what are some common mistakes that you suggest I should avoid? All right, common mistakes. Don't leave your batteries at home. I left my spare battery in the car. Don't leave your memory cards at home. Make sure your camera's set to RAW. Make sure that you focus your lens properly on manual so you can't accidentally shift focus. Um, uh, make sure that everything's buckled down. Make sure your, your camera is on your tripod properly. Make sure that your tripod is solid and Make sure that you get to your location nice and early and make sure that you stay at your location nice and late. Because, let me tell you, it's all too common to pack up your camera thinking you're done for the day and then all the magic happens when you're walking back home. 
Pure and Lee wants to know what my favourite ever photograph taken um, is. Definitely Wild Camp Place Fell. Uh, this image took a lot of hard work and effort to get this image. Um, but it goes to show that if you put in the effort, it can pay off. This image was picked up by Flickr, it was the loading screen for the app, it was on their homepage. Um, this image definitely has contributed somehow to my success. And I love it. I absolutely love the image. Got a question here from Remy on Twitter. Uh, when you show that you're taking one picture in your video, do you actually only take one picture? Um, most of the time, uh, well, in fact, all of the time I'd say yes. Um, for example, when I went to the Alps um, and photographed the murder glass, that was just one, one image. I only took one exposure. What I often do though, is I'll take the same exposure several times over like a half hour period as the light's changing. So uh, yeah, what I don't do is run around taking lots and lots of images from different angles and then figuring out which is the best and then making a video because uh, well, what would be the point in that? Edward, Edward Popper, Edward Popper would like to know um, if photography was not invented, what would you like to do for a living? Uh, can I say film? Is that? No? Okay. Um, maybe something outdoorsy actually. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to work on conservation projects and things like that. Um, good question. I've never, one thing I've never thought about is my career. I've always been really bad at career. Um, never really knew what I, what, what I wanted to do. I've just always managed to wing it somehow. Matty, Matty13. You right, Matty? Matty wants to know, what's the backstory of Mr. Heaton? Where did you begin and get your first big break? Um, look forward to every Wednesday. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, where did it begin? College, probably. Uh, although I've always loved the outdoors. What came first? Photography outdoors, I don't know. Um, my first big break was in 2012. Now, I don't know if it's a big break. I don't think I've had a big break. But uh, in 2012, it was Charlotte's birthday. And for her birthday, I got her a telescope. Now, I'd never done any kind of astrophotography um, and didn't really have a great interest in the night sky, but Charlotte did. So for her birthday, I got her a telescope. On her birthday, we went to a little bed and breakfast in Scotland. And it just so happens that that bed and breakfast was in a uh, official dark sky park in Galloway Forest Park. So we decided to go to uh, this... Uh, Clattering Shores Lock, which is in the middle of a dark sky park, and we'd take a telescope and we'd go stargazing. Um, and I had my camera. Uh, it was a, yeah, I think, I think I had like a Sigma 10 to 20mm lens, um, and I thought I'd try and photograph the Milky Way. So we're in this car park next to the lock, and it's the middle of the night, freezing cold, but really clear skies. And uh, Charlotte had a telescope and she was looking at the stars. I had my camera trained on the Milky Way with the lock in the foreground and I was taking some pictures and it was a really great evening. And then out of nowhere, this, this, this light appeared in the sky, this huge light. And Charlotte was screaming. She was saying, Tom, Tom, what's that? What's that? And I looked and I thought it was a plane crash. I thought it was a plane on fire. That's what it looked like. And I thought, no, it can't be. I thought it must be a firework and it was sparking and it was colourful and it was this hot, this fireball flying through the sky with trails and sparks coming over it. Now, have you ever seen a shooting star or a meteor? They tend to last less than a second. If you get a really, really good earth grazer, it might last for two, if you're really lucky, three seconds. This fireball went from one horizon to the other horizon. I think it went from like east to west yeah, east to west horizon, and it was in the sky for about 45 seconds. It was in the sky long enough for me to look at it, figure out finally what it was, run over to my camera, hit the shutter speed, and then leave my camera, taking a 30 second exposure of the Milky Way, whilst this fireball flew across the Milky Way. Anyway, that fireball sparked 999 calls across Europe. Not just the UK, it was all of Scandinavia as well. Um, scientists and astronomers were blown away by it. It, was, it caused this huge thing in the UK, this huge ripple. Everyone wanted to know what it was. Loads of 999 emergency calls and everything. It was crazy. And I 
was the only person in the whole of the UK and Scandinavia who got a tangible photograph. There were a couple of images pulled from CCTV, um, a couple of shaky handheld ones taken on phones because it did last for like almost a minute in the sky, maybe 30, 40 seconds, 40, well more, yeah, about 40 seconds. But I was the only one. And not only did I get a tangible image, I've got an image with a super wide lens on a tripod with the Milky Way in a dark sky park. You can't get better than that. It was one in a million chance. This image was one in a million. Okay, never been, never photographed the night sky before, never been to a dark sky before, and bought Charlotte her telescope the very same day. So um, I had this image and uh, I saw it all on the news and it was on every, yeah, every single uh, news channel was reporting this fireball. Uh, every newspaper was reporting it and I had the image. So I put it on social media, I was getting phone calls from TV networks, phone calls from newspapers, phone calls from television shows. Uh, was it Sunday Brunch called me? And they all wanted this image. And to this day, I still get checks in the post for this image. Um, I think my latest check was 90 quid. And that was, uh, that was, that came to me about a month ago. So, uh, yeah, that image was definitely my big break, my first taste of um, selling an image. And because of that image, I signed up with loads of different photo agencies and yeah, it, was, it got on people's books. It was really good. So I'd say that image was my big break. I hope you enjoyed that story. Um, all right, how ho, ho, are you? Greg, Greg Photog. Hi, Greg. Are you ever coming to Australia or New Zealand? Yes, yes, I am, but I can't say when. Um, it's on the list. David Abs, how do you get motivated following a bad trip or a bad couple of trips? Good question, because I have bad trips all the time. Uh, wet, windy, miserable, forgetting kit, not making an image. Um, sometimes the best way to get motivated is just to pack up my camera gear, leave it in a cupboard and just forget about it maybe for a few days. Because sometimes you can immerse yourself too much in photography. And it's like drinking too much coffee or eating too much chocolate. It becomes a bit sickly, um, especially when it's not going well. So I just I just have a break. And then it usually takes a few days and a bit of reading of books or looking on social media before I get inspired again. Um, but yeah, luckily those feelings very rarely last. Uh, but yeah, I've had some bad times with my camera. Matthew Brooks wants to know, what's he say? Quite a few landscape photographers have moved to mirrorless. Is this something you would consider? Right, Matthew, um, uh, mirrorless, mirrored, mirror ball, I couldn't care, I could not care less, okay? We pay a lot of money for cameras, right? So it's not our job to worry about how they work. A camera is a camera is a camera. If it's got a mirror, if it's not got a mirror, I couldn't give two hoots. Mirrorless has lots of advantages, mainly in weight and size. Um, I, I will consider mirrorless at the minute. The only mirrorless camera I will seriously consider is the Fujifilm GFX 50S, which looks phenomenal. Uh, if you're watching Fujifilm, I'll take one of those off your hands. Jeff Miller, I've just invested in my first DSLR and as an excitable hobbyist photographer, what would you say are the essentials that I should invest in? Do not just improve my photography, but get the most out of my camera. Okay, Jeff, make sure you've got a tripod, uh, maybe get a polarizer, and invest in yourself. Um, <laughs> sounds a bit cheesy. Buy a plane ticket, buy a train ticket, go and rent a and b in a national park, because to make beautiful images, you need to put yourself in front of something beautiful. Fine k I don't know how you pronounce CH, how do you pronounce CH? Um, fine or finny. Um, hi Thomas, this question has always been on my mind. Do you have any tips for finding your own style in landscape photography and distinguishing it from others and making it stand out? Okay, uh, yeah, there, there are trends, there are photography trends. And you're right, uh, you look at some images and you think, oh, that looks like his image and it looks like his. It's because of the world we live in. Um, I'm sure we're all guilty of looking at everyone's work and comparing our work to their work and being inspired by other people's works. Um, and we're bound to be influenced by other photographers' work. And that's what these trends are. Um, and it's not necessarily our fault. I'd say it's the media's fault. It's the magazines 
um, and these big competitions, they'll pick images to go on the front cover of the magazines, they'll pick images to go in articles, and they'll choose winning images of major competitions, and you'll notice that they all have a similar look to them. I think what's in at the minute are uh, misty trees um, and woodland, and I'm guilty of it more than anyone. Um, but yeah, I, I see it as by following a trend is nothing more than being inspired and influenced by other images, and that's a good thing. Uh, developing your own style, um, I don't know, just do what you love. You know, I, I don't worry about looking like I'm following a trend, because if I want to go and shoot a woodland because it's misty and frosty, I'll go and shoot that woodland. Um, but yeah, if you want to develop your own style, maybe stick to one specific niche like mountains or seascapes or the earth. Try and find a theme. Photo Jorius, how did you get noticed as a landscape photographer? YouTube. Kim Grant, has YouTube helped you get noticed as a landscape photographer and would you recommend it to someone starting out? No. Now you landscape photographers don't want to know. No, do not start a YouTube channel. It's a waste of time. Don't need the competition. YouTube is amazing. YouTube is, I've said this in other videos, YouTube is the second biggest search engine after Google. Uh, YouTube is the reason I got noticed. I owe everything to YouTube and obviously the people who watch my YouTube. So um, I would recommend it 100%. God, Cohen Jantz, Jantz, Cohen Jantz. I'm gonna, gonna risk it here, Cohen. I'm gonna risk it and say Cohen Jantz. Uh, what would be your number one tip for young landscape photographers to get more known in the world of photography? Um, consistency, try and push yourself. When you're young, you've got two things on your side. You've got time and you've got resilience and fitness, that kind of thing. So, yeah, do an expedition. That's what I would do. Tor Haug Svensson. Um, <laughs> Tor Haug Svensson? Tor, Tor Svensson, will you go to Norway again? Yes, Tor, I am going to Norway in two or three weeks time. Very much looking forward to it. Thomas Kralik, where would you want to be with your photography in five years time? Thomas, I don't know, that's a horrible question. I don't like looking into the future. Never been a future guy. Um, I'd like to have a book. I'd like to publish a hardback book or two or three. Uh, I'd love to have more structure. You know, it'd be nice to build an empire around my photography and YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, maybe do courses, online courses, more workshops, more travel. Yeah, just, just anything that allows me to keep shooting, basically. Brian, Car Brian Karchewski. What are your thoughts on post-processing? How much is too much? Where do you draw the line? Okay, post-processing is, unless you're shooting film, is essential, 100% essential. You need to do post-processing. You should be shooting raw, and then you need to get that raw file, and do a bit of post-processing on it. Otherwise, if you shoot JPEGs, then your camera does all the post-processing, and that's no good. So raw file, set your white balance, tweak your exposure, highlight shadows, contrast, that kind of thing. Try and get it looking. Right, here's natural, and here's, you know, good. So, you want your image looking good, and you want it looking natural. So you want it somewhere between those two points. And I think when you start, when it starts to look fanciful, when it starts to look otherworldly, um, when it can be misleading, then I think that's too far. Um, it'd be nice to process, capture and process an image, and then confidently be able to show that image to someone and then take them back in time to when you took it and they can look at the image and look at the scene and go, wow, yes, it really was that good. That That's what you should be aiming for. But then it's not, you know, it's also a creative thing. So you do what you want. Uh, Billy Cooper, why didn't you just push those idiots into the lava? Furious. Right, so Billy is referring to a video I did a while back in Hawaii where people crossed a line, a physical line. Um, and they were in a place where they shouldn't have been. Now, I want to clear this up. I want to get something straight here. I am not a stickler for the rules, okay? I break rules myself. I flip in videos of me on YouTube wild camping, which is completely illegal, okay? Well, technically illegal, but it's it's kind of 
accepted, okay? I'll climb over walls, I'll climb over fences, I'll go into private land. Um, but it's all about common sense and courtesy, okay? I will never climb a fence into an area I shouldn't be if it means I'm obscuring the view for someone else. Or even if it means I'm encouraging someone else to follow me. Um, so if on a YouTube video I happen to be on private land, I'll never say that I'm on private land. I'll never say where that, low, that area is. Um, if, if it's not going to hurt anyone, if it's going to do no damage, if there's no livestock in a field, if there's nothing being broken, no crops are being trampled on, nobody's view is being obscured, then I'll do it. It's common sense, okay? But what happened in Hawaii, um, all these people crossed over the line so they could get a better view of the lava, and in doing so, they were blocking the view for everyone else who was sticking to the rules. Um, so, yeah, uh, obviously I didn't push them <laughs> into the uh, into the sea. I just politely asked them to move after sharing my frustrations on camera. Brendan James wants to, Brendan James Waterman wants to know what is your go-to piece of walking equipment? Jacket, boots. Bag. Walking equipment is really important with landscape photography. Uh, my uh, thinking is there are some things in life and in photography and, and in general that you can get cheap. Uh, this is like it's like four quid. But then there are other things that you shouldn't scrimp on. So walking equipment definitely. If you're gonna buy cheap walking boots, you'll buy twice. I promise you. So walking boots good. But my go-to equipment now is uh, walking poles because they take all the stress off your knees and ankles. They distribute the weight of your heavy rucksack evenly and they just make life easier. And I reckon I can walk double uh, the distance with poles than if I didn't have them. They, they, they make that much of a difference. So I'm going to say walking poles. Um, if you're gonna get boots, I like Scarpa. Reeny, Reeny Warren, how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? A woodchuck would, a woodchuck would chuck, a woodchuck would, a woodchuck, a woodchuck could chuck, a woodchuck could chuck. If a woodchuck could chuck wood, a woodchuck would chuck as much as he could. Ben Harvey's got an interesting question. If you could never share any of your images, either exhibiting or online, if if it was impossible for me to share images, so if I took photographs that nobody ever saw, then yeah, 100% I would still continue to take photographs because I enjoy the process. I enjoy the ability to create something. I enjoy being outdoors in nature. I enjoy looking at the world in a different way. Mick Morrison, are you going to sell more prints? Well, thank you for asking, Mick. Yes, I am. I'm having, I have a new website. It's not ready yet. It's so close. Um, but on that website, I do plan to sell a limited amount of limited edition prints. Um, I've got the papers. I've got everything. It's, I'm currently figuring out which images I'm going to print on which papers and what size and all that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, 100%. Um, I really do love the printing process and it's um selling prints is a great way to help support this channel as well and yeah so yes yes i am uh stephen parker have have you found your spare batteries thank you stephen yes i have carol old old sage old sage uh have you ever considered the idea of using a large format camera carol do you not watch my videos I have ordered a Intrepid 4x5 large format film camera and that will be with me, should be with me now actually, come on Intrepid, where is it? I don't know, it's due, it's due in the next few weeks. Uh, Gregory Standart, uh, hi Thomas, I have a few questions for you. Well, I'm sorry Greg, but I can only give you one of these. How do you make it? No, I've done that. Do you... <laughs> okay. Do you script every video beforehand or do you just go with the flow? Let me tell you this, Greg. I don't script anything. Not a single thing. To script one of my videos out on location would be a disaster. No, no, completely go with the flow. What happens, happens. Tony Murdoch. How waterproof are modern DSLR cameras? As a hobby, I wouldn't take mine out in some of the weather I've seen in your videos. But could it stand it? Uh, Tony, I'm not a manufacturer of cameras, but I do trust the big brands. So if Canon tell me that their camera's weather sealed, I believe them. 
as you've seen from my videos. Uh, yeah, it's a tricky one. If your camera is insured, don't worry about it. Take risks, that's how you get the best images. Don't baby your equipment. It's a tool and you need to use the tool and you need to be out there doing it and getting stuck in. So don't be irresponsible. Don't go out in torrential heavy rain. But again, don't worry about it if it does get wet. Um, you'll probably get better images for it, to be honest. So yeah, they're, they're pretty solid. But read your manual. Julian Baird. Okay, Julian, here we go. When you're out in the field making a video, how do you balance your desire to make a good image and the need to talk to the camera? If you are making a video, image always comes first. My motto is no image, no video. So it's always the image. The, the image is the centerpiece to everything. That's the reason, the reason why I've got this. It's the reason why I take this out and I film myself. It's all for the image. The moment I start going out to make a video, just for the sake of making a video, not because I want to capture a gorgeous image, and that's when it all begins to fall apart. Uh, I'll admit that I definitely put a lot more thought into my videos now than I did. So whereas I'm taking a lovely image, I'm also thinking, right, how can I get the best possible video? And that's when this guy comes in and the drone comes in. So yeah, but the moment the video starts to affect the taking of the image is the moment that it all goes wrong. Okay, Ramunus K. Fishermang. Hello, Tom. Hello, Ramunus. Can you please tell me a bit about the food you eat when out photographing? I see you climbing cliffs like a goat. Thank you. Running long distances uphill. Uh, I'm a big believer in a healthy lifestyle. Uh, I drink, I love a beer and a whiskey, but I drink moderately. I drink, but I don't get drunk. Um, I have a 70-30 rule. It really should be 80-20, but it's not. It's 70-30. So 70% 70 good stuff, avocados, quinoa, flatbreads, fish, rice, vegetables, fruit, juices. And then the other 30% is fish and chips, McDonald's breakfast, chocolate. Health is hugely underrated um, as a landscape photography tool, if you like. Um, to do landscape photography, you need to get up early. You need to stay out late. You need to have lots of energy. You need to explore. You need to go to places, new places, walk long distances, feel good about doing it. Um, so health is vitally important. Um, it always pays dividends to look after yourself so you've got energy to be able to put back into your work. Any reason why you chose Canon instead of another brand? No. No reason. I'll tell you why I shoot with Canon. The reason I shoot with Canon over Nikon, Pentax, Fujifilm, Sony, Panasonic. The reason is when I went to the shop, when I went to the camera shop in 2005 and bought my first DSLR, you know what the guy recommended? Recommended a Canon. And that's it. That's, that's it. No other reason. Uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again, I think they're all much of a muchness. I really don't think there's a huge difference between all these cameras. Give me a Nikon, give me a Canon, give me a Pentax. Couldn't care. Mirrorless, mirrored, don't care. As long as it takes a nice image, I'm happy. Um, yeah, and the state with Canon, because once you've got a brand of camera, not only do you get used to the brand and the ergonomics and everything like that, but you also pick up all the little bits and pieces. And trust me, if Canon stopped making good cameras, I would stop buying them. <laughs> It's that simple. Um, so that's why I chose Canon. So that's the end of my Q&A. It has been long, uh, but I really wanted to cover as much as I possibly could. I'd like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace make websites and online stores. They've got 24 seven customer service, award-winning templates and designs. So if you're a photographer and you need a new website, definitely consider Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com forward slash Heaton and start a free trial. And if you like the free trial and you want to buy something for 10% off your first purchase, use the promo code Heaton. Make your next move with Squarespace. Right, thank you for putting up with me. I'm now going to go and let some blood flow into my legs. Until next time, bye for now. Ah! So one of the standout moments for me 
on uh, New Lives in the Wild, which is a TV show that you've done, was when, when you castrated a live goat with your teeth. <laughs>